On the island of Sodor, one would think that the entire network of the Fat Controller's railway is operated under his control and by his own fleet of engines. But this has never been the case. Foreign engines have always come and gone on the railway, but engines from the other railway do still venture onto northwestern metals. There has always been a suburban service on the Balahu line from Barrow to Norumbi. This has always been under the control of British Railways. The tradition has been carried on into the privatisation era. The Fat Controller has never been able to award the branch line to any of his engines, as his current fleet are busy enough as it is. The Fat Controller always had plans to invest in a small locomotive to take charge of the branch. But since the foreign engines do such a good job and keep bringing tourists to the Balahu line, the Fat Controller had decided not to and to keep a good relationship with Northern Rail, who now operate on the line. At Balahu was a small junction. One line would head towards Norumbi and another to Croven's Gate. But a third line was also present. The line was rusty and very overgrown. It headed into a wood and had not been used in a very long time. Just visible above the trees that dominated the line was an old manor house. The building was derelict and stood dilapidated and falling apart. It sat on a hill close to the line. At the bottom of the hill was a small halt which served the manor. Like the line, it was overgrown and in desperate need of repair. None of the Fat Controller's engines had really seen it before. They very rarely ventured onto the line. But this was all about to change. Donald and Douglas were resting in the sheds on the Little Western when the Fat Controller arrived. Donald and Douglas, I bring exciting news, he began. You will be working on the Balahu line over the winter. The Scottish twins looked at him confused. Balahu, they said together. That's correct. The National Trust has bought the manor near the line and wishes to restore the building into a tourist attraction, announced the Fat Controller. I have offered our services to help clear the line leading to the manor and to help with the building project. A new service will be drawn up, and to attract more visitors, you two will be in charge of the steam shuttles to the manor. Donald quickly interrupted. But sir, what about our ballast trains here? The holiday season is now over, and Duck and Oliver can easily manage the workload for the time being, reassured the Fat Controller. Donald and Douglas were very pleased, and couldn't wait to start work. Two days later, and Douglas steamed along with an engineer's train to Balahu. As he stood waiting to let the suburban train clear the road, he noticed the manor. It looked daunting and foreboding above the high, twisting branches of the trees. Och, that does look canny spooky, muttered Douglas to himself. Memories of what had happened to him and Bear at the works with the ghost of old Dean Morris came flooding back. Come on, Douglas, called his driver. There's nothing to be scared of. Hey, that's what they all see, whispered Douglas. As the Caledonian engine rolled up to the points, he began to jitter at the slightest sound or movement. Crows began wailing crossly. The wind howled between the trees, and the old rails screeched under the engine's weight. Calm down, old boy, comforted the driver. What's wrong? Oh, <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all, quivered Douglas nervously. Workmen began clearing the undergrowth. Time seemed to stand still for poor Douglas. He wanted to leave, but he couldn't. He could see the manor through the branches of the leafless trees. Douglas felt very small compared to its dominating appearance. 
Eventually, darkness fell, and the workmen were packing up their tools ready for home. As Douglas was preparing to back away, there was a sudden gunshot, followed by a scream. Douglas jumped in horror. The workmen leaned out of the works coach. They had all been startled by the gunshot, but even more concerned at the sound of a woman screaming. Then Douglas nearly cried in fright. A young woman came running out of the darkness along the line from the manor. Look at that! shouted the fireman. Get me out! Get me out! shrieked Douglas. Before his driver could check him, Douglas shot backwards. They raced out into the junction and didn't stop until they reached Bickerstown. Once there, the crew immediately phoned the police. They checked all around the abandoned line, but no woman could be found. The next day, the police interviewed the crew and the workmen alongside Douglas. I heard a gunshot, exclaimed a workman. I heard a scream, said another. And we saw the woman, added the fireman. She was in a frantic rush to get away from something. Uh, didn't you stop to help her? questioned the policeman suspiciously. No, sir, said Douglas sheepishly. Uh, that was my fault. I got scared, so I ran away, sir. The fat controller, who was listening to the interview, tutted at Douglas. We'll investigate the matter as best as we can. But well, there isn't much evidence to go off, explained the policeman. He turned and walked away to his car. What we saw was real, all right, said the driver firmly to the fat controller, and I'm not going anywhere near that manor again. You understand? Douglas, his fireman, and the workman agreed. The fat controller spoke crossly to them. You will all be assigned to repairing point work at Vickers Town Yard. I can't have engines and staff that won't do as they are told. Give me repairing point work any day, muttered a workman to Douglas. Douglas couldn't have agreed more. Soon the story spread down the line, and it all became a great joke to Donald when the police found no evidence of a shooting or a fleeing woman in distress. Anyone would think that Doogie was one of these spiritualists that contact the dead, teased Donald rudely. Shut up, burst out Bear, that's not funny. Hey, same goes to you too, puffed Donald. First this rubbish about old Dean Morris, and now all this. When's it going to end? I believe Douglas, growled Bear. He doesn't need you laughing at him, he needs you to look out for him. Bah! He's leaving me to do all that work. I'll start looking out for him when he turns a wheel. That's very harsh of you, Donald, snapped Bear furiously. Ah, stupid Doogie, there is no such things as ghosts, huffed Donald confidently. <laughs> Famous last words, murmured Bear quietly. Over the next few weeks, Donald took charge of the engineering works with a fresh group of workmen. Each night, Donald would return home proudly after a hard day's work. He would purposefully embarrass his twin at the fact that they hadn't run into anything supernatural yet. Douglas would get very cross, and soon it too began to annoy the other engines. Somehow, something didn't feel right. Eventually, Donald and the workmen reached the small halt at the bottom of the manor. They had cleared away the branches and trees that stood too close to the line, and had completely replaced the old rails with new ones. Donald looked up. He could see the manor looming over him from the top of the hill. It does look very sinister, admitted the driver. Dare tell me you believe all this ghost nonsense, snorted Donald. I have an open mind. There are some things we can't explain. Donald wished steam at the thought. A couple more days passed, and the station halt was receiving attention. Each day, Bertie the bus would deliver builders and volunteers and the restoration of the manor to the site. 
He would stop at the driveway to the manor and watch happily as they made their way to work. But each morning, there seemed to be less and less people going to help at the manor. Donald hadn't taken any notice of this, but Bertie had. Rumours began to spread around the site, until one day Bertie was told the rumour. He immediately found Douglas at Vickerstown Station. Edward was stood close by when Bertie screeched in. You were right about something strange about that manor house, called Bertie. Uh, why? asked Douglas. The manor is haunted. Something's been scaring the volunteers away, and now hardly anyone is going up there to restore it. Douglas was surprised. You didn't say? Indeed, replied Bertie. They're thinking of putting the project on hold. It's gotten so bad. I hope for Donald's sake he doesn't make a beeline for him. Bertie drove away, leaving Douglas very worried for his twin. Edward, who had heard everything, steamed silently away. That evening, a suburban service heading to Barrow was running late. Donald and the engineering train could not leave until it had cleared the section of signals at the junction. Darkness fell around the manor, and the weather was beginning to close in. As the driver eased open the regulator, there was an ear-piercingly loud scream, followed by a gunshot. Donald was brought to a quick stop. Did you hear that? whispered the driver. There was a long pause. The workman, along with the crew, stepped down and walked towards the front of the locomotive. The wind began to blow through the branches of the trees. Donald started to feel very uncomfortable. The men crept forward. None of them breathed a word. Suddenly, out of the darkness, strolled a man. He was dressed in a soldier's uniform and holding a rifle in one hand. The men began to stumble back. The soldier stared coldly at the group of men and slowly began to reload his rifle. The driver, fireman, guard and workman all fled in fear of their lives. They scrambled along the ballast and raced towards the junction, leaving Donald behind. Wait! cried Donald in alarm. Then I leave me here! The wind began to howl violently as the soldier walked along the ballast towards Donald. Each footstep became louder and louder as he came closer. Donald was close to tears. He couldn't bear it any longer. He closed his eyes tightly until suddenly... Donald peered open his eyes. No one was there. The soldier had gone. The next morning, Donald was pulled from the line back to the sheds. Donald was very pale. He couldn't stop his wheels from trembling. Douglas comforted him by his side. No one said a word until Edward broke the silence. Balahoo Manor used to be owned by a lord and lady. They were rich enough to own a private railway which served the manor. But the manor was commandeered by the military to serve as a hospital for injured and wounded soldiers of the First World War. And so the lord and lady were forced to leave. Part of the manor was separated from the rest. It became a mental asylum for those who suffered severe cases of shell shock from the trenches. Foreign engines who brought these men from the mainland had to witness some terrible things. One such incident was of a soldier who suffered so badly from shell shock he escaped the asylum, stole a rifle from the gamekeeper and shot a nurse in the woods near the line. He then killed himself, and a foreign engine found their bodies. Ever since then, the soldier and the nurse have haunted the manor. Such is the severity of these supernatural occurrences that after the war, the lord and lady abandoned the manor and left it to ruin. The nurse is always hiding from the soldier, and the soldier is always looking for his next victim.
none of the engines had anything to say. The fat controller had heard everything. He turned and walked thoughtfully away. A week later, the project to restore the manor was called off. Plans for its restoration ground to a halt, and the line was ripped up. Balahu Manor now stands, languishing, ready to accept its fate and fade away from memory. Donald and Douglas hope that the ghosts they saw will soon disappear along with the manor itself. <laughs>